Good evening, and welcome to the Voice of the Forge video game literacy uh, introduction. Um, basically, I did a short five minute presentation on this not so long ago about where I was stating that I would talk about um, video games and um, basically uh, semiotic analysis. Now this is uh, a subject that can get quite long-winded and can get quite technical so I am hoping to make it as entertaining as possible and hopefully to make it as informative possible informative as possible. Now the first thing that people say is that playing video games is a waste of time. Then the other um, uh, shoe on the foot as it were is that uh, video games teach us how to be sexist and how to be violent. Now all of these miss the fundamental point of what a game actually is at some level um, and without delving too far into the hierarchy of needs uh, on my blog page uh, there is um, a couple of uh, blog notices where I have actually uh, got a series of why we play what we play which unfortunately was abandoned due to ill health uh, I hope to pick that up at some point but that was looking much more about the psychological needs that play meets along the along with um, hunger reproduce uh, reproduction for the uh, continuation of the species sleep and things like that now today is very much laying the groundwork, the foundation, for the rest of the series. So uh, it uh, it may seem a little bit like I'm uh, belabouring the point, but um, I just want to try and make sure that people know exactly where I'm coming from and that they understand um, effectively what it is that I'm saying. Now, um, Today we live in uh, what they call a postmodern culture, and it is a culture that doesn't um, thrive on grand narratives. Uh, now, a grand narrative is uh, something like uh, a long uh, story told in various different ways, and the easiest way to explain a grand narrative would be through um, urban narrative. The, 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 the town or city where you live has a story to tell through uh, the buildings that still exist, the buildings that used to exist, the kind of jobs that they used to be. And the easiest example to give of this would be to uh, quickly uh, give a rundown of two cities in England, one the city of York and the other city of Lincoln. Now when you look at the two cities they do look completely different and whilst they both function for um, tourism as quite a large part of their um, overall uh, economic uh, ability York favours tourism far far more than Lincoln does uh, the, the industry uh, in York has managed to uh, combine its history in such a way that it, that, that, uh, it now markets that history. Uh, whereas Lincoln, um, having pretty much a similar history in the fact that the Romans found it important as they did York, Lincoln is on uh, a crossroads between the two main Roman roads, the Ermine and Fosway, um, and other things like this, the fact that Lincoln Castle was uh, one of the first finished castles for Norman uh, for the Norman Conquest with William the Conqueror, uh, these all became things uh, that established the city as an important thing. And Lincoln has uh, a long history with kings and queens. Uh, you may have heard of Eleanor Crosses um, in London and the fact that there, there were various stops made on the way from where she died to where she was buried. Uh, there are these kinds of things in Lincoln which you have to really dig for 
Whereas in York, you can go there, you've got a Madame Tussauds uh, museum in the York dungeon, just the same as the London dungeon. Uh, you've got much more made of the Jorvik Viking Centre and the Viking history of York, whereas Lincoln has... Um, uh, a, a Viking history um, you only have to look as far as some of the street names like Danesgate and other places to see where there's parcels of land involved with the Danes with the Northmen, with the Viking um, and the, the history is there but it hasn't been curated properly and because it hasn't been curated in quite the same way as York has, the urban narrative between the two cities is vastly different. Now Lincoln relies much more on the Christmas market than York does, whereas York has got a much more um, even spread of tourism because you can go there in the summer and then they have things in the winter as well. York Minster is a big draw, uh, which is quite a large and famous cathedral, but then Lincoln Cathedral uh, is quite a large and famous cathedral. Um, and it's the, the the fact that Lincoln hasn't built on its historical narratives of who of, of the Roman ancestry, uh, um, of the Viking ancestry, and everything else. Uh, it's very much more um, a second um, place runner to York. So when you look at things such as like an urban narrative, that's the sort of thing you'd look at, is who's in charge, who's been curating that a area, and what story does it tell us about that history's past. Now, um, one important thing for urban narrative is to look at what they call semiotics and signs. Um, and this is where you break down uh, things into uh, parcels of information which convey meaning. Now, one of the earliest examples we've got of something that is a pure sign with a meaning, uh, apart from words, would be hieroglyphs. We, we, I can, we can all understand a hieroglyph and say that denotes a certain thing because of what is in the picture. It, 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 if you've got a cartouche, it's read a certain way, it's got certain symbols in there, and it forms a whole uh, image when you can decode it that gives you uh, meaning and uh, gives you something to actually uh, be able to pass on. Now, words in and of themselves have no meaning because without meaning, they're just chicken scratches on the ground. It is the fact that you have someone who is able to encode information in these chicken scratchings and it is understood well enough that a second person, a third party, can look at the writing on the ground, look at these chicken scratches and go, I know what you mean. I know that you want X, Y or Z doing. I know that it's, it, 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 it's something that is transmittable. And as such, there are always three things to do with a sign. And that is the fact you have the sign itself, and you have a decoder and an encoder. Pretty much anyone who knows anything about um, internet safety, security, WAP keys and everything else can understand this quite straightforwardly because it's something which we do daily uh, with regards to computer programs and everything else. But it is important to note uh, that a sign isn't uh, that conveys information isn't the thing itself. And the easiest way to reference this is Descartes' um, Ceci ne pas une pipe, okay, where he's where he's drawn a pipe on a bit of paper and he's written that underneath. Now the reason it's not a pipe is because he can't use it to smoke tobacco. It's a representation of a pipe. It's a simulcra. It's something that is an idea, a conception of something that exists, but isn't the thing itself. And this is something that is very, very important when talking about abstracts and, cod and codified images, because they're not the image themselves. And this is where I believe that Anas Anita Sarkeesian has fallen into a huge, huge trap because she doesn't understand the basics of this semiology. Just because it's a picture of a woman doesn't make it a woman. Just because it's a picture of a gun doesn't make it a gun. This is something that has um, been overlooked and it's been um, completely ignored by a, a whole swathe of experts. Now, the reason why I talk about various literacies is because uh, we make a big thing about being numerate, about being literate, being able to read and write. And then we also make a big thing about being computer literate, as in being able to understand and work computers. But then we don't talk about that much like science literacy. 
you've got to be literate in the language of science to be able to encode and decode the ideas. If I say to you E equals MC squared, if you are literate in Einsteinian relativity, then you understand what that means. If you've never studied Einstein, if you don't know who Einstein is and you don't know anything about the theory of relativity, it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything to you. It's something that, yeah, okay, it's there. I can see E equals MC squared. Well, that doesn't tell me a thing. I have no understanding of what you're talking about. To me, it's gibberish. And this is something that we find very much with video games. It's very, very, very much um, a thing with films, with books, and with games. Now, I will talk briefly about games and books, purely because um, games, books, and film uh, all um, link into one another. And the fact that we we have had cinema now for just over 100 years, and we've been able to show the progression from simple storylines to complex storylines, uh, lighting for certain things. There have become various um, shortcuts that film use, which are known as tropes. And you can find these in anime, you can find them in film, uh, you can find them in certain areas. And now certain things that are pioneered by certain directors how, uh, can become themselves uh, a shorthand which allows you to, when you're studying a film or you're studying a text that's been made into a film, that you can understand what is going on in a meta-analysis, such as if you understand the difference between um, method acting and the former uh, role of acting, which was like a proclamation, a declamation, uh, are, which the actors, which were traditionally trained, used to use. Um, an example of where this collides would be Streetcar Named Desire, where you have the difference in acting styles, uh, where Marlon Brando is using method acting, and you've got the old style of acting from, and I forget the actress's name, uh, but she's very famous from Gone with the Wind. Uh, um, and it's this kind of thing that if you're not well versed, if you are not literate in a certain genre or a certain media or a certain type of symbolism, like uh, then you mistake things. Uh, take the occult, for instance. This is something that is uh, always a hot topic in America because the occult is of the devil, the occult is evil, the occult is this. Whereas in fact, all it means is hidden. The word occult just means hidden. It's from occlude, to, 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 to hide. It, it, it's this thing which is hidden knowledge, which has not been mainstream. It's esoteric knowledge, which in many ways the church has tried to suppress. So when we look at a witch, when we look at a warlock, when we look at a five-star pentagram, it, whether or not you see the devil's horns and beard in that or not depends very much upon your frame of reference. And your frame of reference is all the experiences that you've had and all the literacies that you have and where you can put them all together to make uh, judgments about what is being encoded and how. And when you study literature, for example, you are taught a different way of looking at the text, different way of looking at characterization. What can you encode from a character's name? What can you decode in terms of the strategies used in order to tell the story? Is it a first-person narrative? Is it a third-person narrative? This kind of thing, these all go into this, in, in, into this literacy of signs and symbols. And much as I do not want to um, give uh, a huge amount of time to this, the fundamental way that you can understand this at a very, very basic level, and I know philosophy courses in some areas do actually teach this, but if we look at the film The Matrix, now, the film The Matrix, it has all kinds of symbolism which are fairly easy to decode, like say, say goodbye Dorothy, Kansas is going bye-bye, that's obviously from The Wizard of Oz by Frank L. Baum. Now, the things like the red pill and the blue pill that they talk about, do you prefer reality, do you prefer the illusion, these are all things that come from a uh, journal, um, a published work by a guy called Jay Boudriard called Signs and Simulcra. Now, Whilst we look at that and go, okay, that's the that's the text where this uh, sort of comes from, about how you can have things that become uh, encoded with meaning and then become hyper real. Um, that if you look at the film, 
uh, he actually picks up a copy of uh, Signs and Smulker by J. Brugiard. But when he opens it, it's not a book, it's hollowed out. And it contains the program that he gives to the guy, his girlfriend, has got the white rabbit on the shoulder. So it plays with this whole subject right from the very start. Uh, it plays with the whole um, notion of, oh, you're my own personal Jesus Christ, whereas by the end of the third film, he does kind of sacrifice himself for the good of the many, um, which is a Christological example. But then you've got things that are much more simple, like uh, see how far the rabbit hole goes, you've got the white rabbit, you've got things from Lewis Carroll's Alice's in Wonderland, if you don't know these books and these stories, then these code, these coders mean nothing to you because you don't have that frame of reference. Um, it means that you're looking at it and going, yes, yeah, so what? It's a, it's a tattoo of a white rabbit. But if you know the story of Alice chasing the white rabbit and falling down the rabbit hole, it then takes on a more significant meaning, just as if you understand the whole point of the Science and Smoker book not being a book, even though it looks like one, and uh, containing information which some would... Again, it contains information which some would rather you didn't have. It's something that's forbidden or verboten. It's something which um, signifies uh, oppression or, uh, uh, or um, not necessarily oppression, but suppression of certain ideas or certain things. Um, the very idea that he's getting lectured by the boss, that um, he doesn't fit in, he thinks it's beyond the rules, that they somehow don't apply to you. Uh, this is a technique known as foreshadowing, which goes on through the film quite a bit, whereby there's an early bit of the film that makes sense in relation to the later bit of the film. Um, and foreshadowing is used quite a bit in books, in literature, to try and give you an idea and build suspense. Um, but these are all things which come down to where you can take a piece out of it, you can study it, and you can get all kinds of information uh, that has been encoded into it by one person and decoded by another. And the fact that you can decode it in many different ways, depending on the way in which your mind works, shows that everyone has a bias, everyone has a frame of reference, and every Everyone is looking at it in certain ways. Now, when you start looking at certain types of symbols and certain types of media, it can be very easy to actually mis-decode these things, and you can actually decode them in a way in which the author didn't intend. Take, for instance, the book Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. He swears up and down that that isn't a book about censorship. It was about the death of books because of the rise of television. And yet, we now take it very much as it's about the censorship and the banning of books. If we take um, another look at a, a, other series... Um, you can see that other people have, have looked at books and gone, we think it's this. Um, one of which was uh, Machiavelli, The Prince, uh, which was followed up by The Republic. Now, people have often used that to say, oh, it's very Machiavelli, the end justifies the means, this is the way you get power, keep hold of power and hold on to power. And yet, when that was written, that was actually written as satire not as an actual manual on how to be one of, the, one of the most nasty people that you could come across and how to get your way. It was actually written as satire in much the same way Jonathan Swift's modest proposal was satire, in the fact that it actually was blowing up a caricature, building a straw man, and then laughing at the very nature of the straw man that they've built to show just how absurd other more normative thinking might actually be. And it's this that we run the risk of in video games, where we look at tropes and we look at culture uh, that come from other mainstream outlets, and then we look at games in isolation. If you don't have the correct frames of reference, you can completely miss the point of a narrative. You can completely miss the point of a story because you haven't had sufficient grounding in what the symbols and signs and so on are meant to convey. Now, not every game is going to be as deep and complex as others, uh, and that can be purely down to technological limitation, and certainly wasn't really the case when, you, when we look back uh, to, the, to the dawn of video games, when all we had was Pac-Man, uh, Defender, Space Invader, um, Centipede, when we're looking at Pong, when we're looking at, to an extent, Super Mario and Sonic, there wasn't a huge amount of narrative there, other than 
you get you, you you have to get from one end of the level to the other end of the level in such a way as to gain the most amount of rings or to the most amount of life the least amount of time to find that your princess is in another castle nowadays with the art form maturing and the ability to tell much deeper stories these signs and symbols have become much more coded and much more complex and because of this we need to have an understanding of where video games have come from in order to understand where they are now simply taking a narrative from whole cloth and going this is what they mean because i say so cannot happen because it means that you can miss nuance and you can miss background which is inherent to the storyline and inherent to the medium which can immediately um, mean that your opinion becomes very much slanted or skewed away from the original intentions of the encoder. Um, I've now been talking for about 20 minutes. I shall leave it there. As I said, this is quite a dense subject, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to expand on things and, and, and talk through this more with people. If you have any comments or questions or things that you'd like to see answered, uh, please either uh, tweet me at uh, Twitter on at Voice of the Forge, or leave a comment in the comments section below. Uh, I will be using um, books uh, and not just Google, and where they are properly referenced, they will be in the co they will be in the description box below. Uh, so please um, take your time, enjoy this series, and I hope that uh, I can um, provide something useful for people, uh, which means they will take a, a harder look at what these video games actually mean and maybe even hopefully work with me so that I can make this a much more rich, diverse and complex narrative which uh, whilst I have my biases I'll be able to um, minimise them as much as possible. I am as always Voice of the Forge, thank you very much for listening and good evening.